All right, let's move on to fiber optics today. So I just want to give you a brief reminder of schedule. For fiber optics, you're going to have two weeks to complete this lab. There is no lecture next Monday. Um, I do want to give you a reminder, always look on Blackboard for the most up-to-date up schedule. Here's an example schedule. It might not be accurate for this particular semester. So keep looking at there for an update in terms of what's coming in the, uh, the lab. And it's not too early to start thinking about final projects. That's going to be coming up sooner than you expect. Okay, so today we're mainly going to use a bit of ray wave and electromagnetic optics, and some content will be hard to visualize and will get pretty mathematical, uh, but it won't be too bad. We're going to cover fiber optics, basics, fiber attenuation, single or few mode fibers, dispersion, and fiber amplifiers. Um, to kind of get it started here, you know, here's two example communication modes with equivalent data rates. And so, uh, you know, a commercial fastest fiber, it's a little bit more than that now, but around 100 gigabits per second. It's there, some of them are much a little bit faster than that as well. But that's equivalent to the data transmission of this huge, thick coax line with all these metal wires. And so the nice thing about fiber optics is light travels at 2e to the 8, 3 meters per second. Why is that? Well, that's because speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and then you have to divide it by refractive index of the fiber that gets you down to about 2. Now, would a copper line be similar? It could be, but there's only pro the difference is, is that the copper lines themselves act like waveguides, but the issue you have with the copper line is that you have resistance and capacitance. You have RC time constant RC charging between lines. And if you took that away, it could be just as fast as a fiber. But unfortunately, we know that's not the reality. So just give you an idea of the advantage of an optical fiber versus uh, metal lines. Okay, so let's go back to refraction and look at refraction versus various incidence angles. And we're going to focus on the, the case for total internal reflection. And so this is external refra refraction where I'm going from a low index to a high index and light bends more towards the normal. You can see theta 2 is smaller than theta 1. And then you get the opposite when you're going for internal refraction, when you're going from high refractive index to low refractive index. Light bends more away from the normal. And eventually, as, you, as we've talked about, you'll hit an angle, according to Snell's law, where the refracted angle is 90 degrees. And as soon as you hit that, and, or you hit that, and go beyond that, at that point, the light will be total internally reflected. And so that would be the critical angle. And again, we calculated critical angle using Snell's law. We said theta incident will now be critical angle, okay? And the exit angle would be 90 degrees at that point. Where's the critical angle? Well, if this is sine of 90, I can move N1 over to this side. I can take the inverse sine of this side and then solve for theta C and there's your critical angle related to the refractive index outside and inside where the light's coming from. And so again, total internal reflection occurs when you reach the critical angle for the case of N1 being greater than N2. And what we're interested in today is a waveguide. And so here we've got N1 greater than N2, and we've introduced light into it. This light here is not within the critical angle, so you get a, you get a little bit Fresnel reflected, and you get a little bit uh, refracted. Most of it will be just refracted out, right? However, if we take a light ray and it has a incidence angle here, okay, which is, which is not within the critical angle, then at that point you'll see that we get total internal reflection and we get nice propagation down the waveguide with no optical loss. Now, so what I had just showed you in the end of the previous slide was a slab waveguide. There's other type of waveguides, too. There's strip, where here's the high refractive index region, low refractive index region, and there's fibers. We're going to focus mainly on fibers today. Here's the high refractive index. Here's the low refractive index. Again, in this course, everything you're learning can stretch over to other frequencies in the electromagnetic spectrum. And so what we're learning, if, you, if you're really a microwave-type person, okay, and you look at a microwave transmission line, you see the same analog of a strip waveguide here and a printed circuit board, where here's your metal and here's your, your circuit board plastic. 
And of course, a coax line, if it's going for high speed transmission, similarly, you have the same sort of core and cladding in some ways as well. So it's just interesting to see the, the parallels between what we do with uh, visible light and uh, what we can see in other areas of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, a key thing to remember is we always we said that light diverges normally. You always had some divergence. Even the laser in the lab we measured and showed that it diverged over, di over distance. But the only exception for this is when it's confined inside a waveguide. So light propagating in free space will diverge out, even if it's inside a material, such as glass. If it's not confined, it'll just keep diverging. Whereas for an optical waveguide, is the only case where light will not diverge. So let's look at what an optical fiber looks like. Typical optical fiber is shown here. Typically has a core which is made of silicon dioxide. And I think it's fascinating that the most powerful, the most important material in electronics is silicon, and the most important material in optics and fiber optics is oxidized silicon. And I think it's also because we have a lot of it, just basically beach sand, right? And so a typical fiber core is, is silicon dioxide. The core is typically around 10 microns thick. If it's a fiber that has a few modes, we'll talk more about that later. Then you have a lower index cladding, which is typically 0.1 to 0.3 lower in refractive index to support total internal reflection. Then you've got a polymer layer, which helps protect the fiber, um, and a, then a fiber jacket often, which uh, protects it even further. How do you make these things? Well, what you typically do is you have this huge tower here. You can see the people down here. And at the top, you have a preform, which is a big piece of glass with a core and a cladding that has the right materials, but it's about 10 centimeters wide. It's big, OK? You make that, then you heat it till it's soft, and then it gets drawn out of this tiny little nozzle here downward to the base, where it then cools, forms the optical fiber, and then at the bottom here, you add the polymer layer to protect it. So let's look at optical fibers a little bit more detail, and let's start to discuss numerical aperture. Now, we talked about numerical aperture before. It can be calculated for any type of optical element. Who remembers what it is? Okay. Well, we said that numerical aperture was the light gathering power of some kind of element. And so for a lens, it was what sort of acceptance cone of light could get into the to the um, to the lens that it could it could it could capture. Same thing for an optical fiber. How big of an acceptance cone and acceptance angle theta a can I get for an optical fiber? So this would be light comes in, it's captured and it propagates. That would be within the numerical aperture. If it's outside of the acceptance cone, like you can see, for example in one of these uh, rays here where it made it out into the cladding that would be an unguided ray that's outside the acceptance cone and so we need, a, need it to basically fall within the critical angle for the optical fiber so let's calculate numerical aperture for an optical fiber we'll basically start with Snell's law here and what we'll do is we'll say here comes a light ray it's refracted and we'll say that this is already at the critical angle so we have basically got this at the largest possible theta a such that we can still be within the critical angle and be total internally reflected. Well, if this is theta c, and I notice I've got parallel lines here, then this would be theta c here, and then that makes this 90 minus theta c. So I can put Snell's law here and say n naught sine of theta a is equal to n1 sine of 90 minus theta c. So I just did Snell's law here. And then I'll say, well, sine of 90 minus theta c is the same as cosine of theta c, because sine and cosine are shifted from each other by 90 degrees. And then I'll use sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, right? And then I'll substitute for cosine of theta c, the square root of 1 minus sine squared of theta c. And then I'll remember that if I look at the, the equation for the critical angle, it was sine of theta c, I mean, theta c equals the inverse sine of, of the of the, of the fraction of the refractive indices. I'll put in the equation for critical angle and then I'll end up with n2 over n1 squared. Then out here, I'm going to say, well, n1 is the same, root, same thing as square root of n1 squared. That was easy. And then I'm going to multiply that in there. So I get, let's bring this into the square root. I get my n1 squared out front. When the n1 squared gets multiplied by this, it cancels the n1 in the denominator. And I end up with the sine of the theta a is equal to square root of n1 squared minus 
n2 squared. So, numerical aperture you can calculate as n naught sine of theta a, that's always the equation we had, the maximum acceptance angle. And for an optical fiber, you can calculate that by, by knowing the refractive index of the core and the refractive index of the cladding. And of course, you can get theta a because you know out here in most applications, n naught is just air. So again, numerical aperture is the light gathering power or the sign of the maximum angle at which the optical element, fiber, lens, or anything can capture light. For a fiber, typical theta A values are 5 to 15 degrees since delta N is small. If you have a fiber which is glass, meaning it's probably around 1.46 for the refractive index for the core, if the cladding has a refractive index of less than 1.06, you can solve and find that the theta acceptance angle is equal to 90 degrees, meaning that a bare fiber in air will capture light at all angles onto it, even out to 90 degrees, which is kind of interesting. I know you get a lot of Fresnel reflection, but it shows that that light will be refracted enough in here to be totally internally reflected if you have a, that low of an index cladding. Okay, so at that point, let's do a quick review and take a break, and then we'll get started on the next section.